bonus, businessman, entrepreneur, um, tech mogul, uh, Austin <laughs> Zhang. Yeah, he literally does it all. So he's got a lot to share with us and we're super lucky to have him. And please, Austin, take it away. Maybe tell us a little bit about what we're going to do today. Sure. Um, thanks so much for the intro, Ben. So in the past, say, six months or so, I've really I've built a business for myself called Brave Sound, New, Brave Sound NYC, Brave Sound Productions, uh, that has generated several thousand dollars of income for myself and many other New York City musicians. And I put a lot of deep thought into reading about why people pay money for art, how to leverage the, the internet into a business, how to build careers out of this. So the title, the working title of this workshop that I'll probably give in many different forms uh, in the near and distant future is Building Online Careers for Modern Musicians. It's a bit dry right now, but that's what we're talking about. That's the content, that's the substance. Um, yeah, and so this is the first time I'm giving this workshop, even though I've been talking about business and thinking about this stuff for a long time on my various social channels. So Karen and Ben, if you would like to at really any point chime in with, what do you mean by this? Or with a question from the chat or whatever have you, or if I'm just not being clear, please, please let me know. I'm, this is a learning experience for myself as well as anybody watching. Um, so yes, let us get started. I'll share my screen. And I, I've made this little presentation. So building online careers for modern musicians. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on this kind of introductory assumptions because they're kind of the basis of how I approach social media, how I approach marketing, how I approach dealing and communicating with my audience, everything I do. And those two assumptions that are underlying everything that we're about to talk about are these two things. Number one, money is exchanged for things, acts, ideas, or feelings that are deemed valuable. Number two, your music and your art are deeply valuable to millions of people. You just need to learn to use the internet to find them. So before we start, do you, ha Karen and Ben, do you guys have any thoughts about those two sentences on their own? Yeah, a whole bunch. Um, sure. I think this is probably one of the most difficult things coming out of school, where, that they, just, where they just teach you how to play, um, mm -hmm. to kind of navigate especially money in exchange for the things that you do. So I've always struggled with this immensely. i um, always undershot certain tasks I would be given just for the compensation and didn't really know the best way to make money in this business at all. Mm -hmm. So you're struggling with, does my art have any value at all? Exactly, yeah. Or monetary value, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Like uh, the part where you say that uh, the art can be deeply valuable to millions of people. I'm like millions of people. <laughs> well, that's that's actually the easiest point to prove, you know, I, I, and I'll get to that point. But um, I, I, I don't think it's I can almost guarantee it, you know, just by sheer numbers and what the Internet allows you to do in 2021 and even prior, like what artists would have done in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s for that type of power. I mean, I also acknowledge a lot of negatives, uh, mentally speaking, or, you know, there's there's a lot of potential, especially in children, uh, for just like a lot of social um, calamities <laughs> that occur in the brain as a result of this ultra connectedness. And I know it has the potential for polarization and a lot of negatives as well, but as, a marketing tool as a business tool as a way of reaching an audience it's just uh it's it's really invaluable so let, let's talk about this first assumption money is exchanged for things acts ideas or feelings that are deemed valuable and so i'd like to prove that money is essentially exchanged for value right and in order to talk 
a little get a bit more deeper into that assumption, I challenge you to look at your statements, look at your credit card statements, look at your bank statements, and just literally look at what do you spend money on, right? So you f spend money on your basic living expenses, food, um, transportation, your living expenses, entertainment, all these things I have listed here. And so you might think that it's like a very uh, surface level thing of I buy food to survive, right? But in actuality, you're buying, most of the time what you're buying is feelings, right? So if what you are actually buying is just the bare necessities to survive, you might just get rice and beans and some broccoli and call it a day and spend like 50 cents a meal, right? But, you know, people tend to spend a lot more on that on food. They eat out, they buy organic, they buy supplements. And, you know, there are arguably like a lot of health benefits for that but or social benefits as far as eating with people. But the reason why you'll spend $15 for a meal rather than 50 cents or $100 at a fancy restaurant is not to do with the food, but what you're actually buying there is a feeling or an experience, right? And I think that's where people will spend the most amount of their money. Uh, but always there's some exchange of value, even if it is the bare necessity. I'm not going to give you money just for you asking me for money, which is what I see a lot in the art space. They're like, donate to what we do, we need more money to make art, let's <laughs> give me more money, right? But there's no clear articulation of what am I provide, what value am I giving to your life? Does this make any sense? And um, right, so think about any of these categories. You pay money to the internet service provider company because they give you internet exchange and you need internet. You give money to Netflix because they provide you with entertainment in advance. Uh, not in advance, in exchange for your money. But what about your music? Like, Ben, Karen, do you guys, what type of money do you spend personally on art? Do you give money to other musicians or to artistic organizations? For me personally, yeah. I have a, um, I give to like particular projects that are about to happen. Like if I have a friend who's coming out with an album, I want to, I want to contribute in some way and donate to the recording of that album. Um, that's, that's the bulk of my contributions to other artists. Um, I do give to some arts organizations like uh, jazz power initiative, another good one about jazz education. Um, but I think that's, I think that's pretty much it. I, when I see a project that I really would like to help, that is a, it's, it's enough initiative for me. Yeah, I've, I've given to organizations before, um, usually ones that I've been involved in, in the past. Um, and then I think, oh, well, I mean, I guess in regards to artists specifically, I've tipped before like for yeah. live streams i've bought concert tickets um i go like i've gone to many concerts like mainstream and more local so just depends but yeah i've given money so when you give that money it's really for one of two reasons one is if the organization or that artist the work that they do provides value to you or enriches your life in some way. It inspires you, it makes you feel better, it makes you feel worse or whatever it is. You know, that either their work itself and you want to see that work continue, which is I think a primary reason for supporting artists and arts organizations. And then the other th reason that it could be, which is um, a lot of the reason people donate to various organizations or social justice causes or is is for the feeling it gives them they they get a a positive like dopamine rush i guess um when they are donating to causes that they support uh it's like those commercials for um 
for like they they show like those really destitute dogs and they say like you know a subscription of just ten dollars a month will feed five dogs and take them off the streets and like people want that feeling that's what they're buying you know they never get to see the dogs get rescued off the streets they never get to see they, they just want the feeling of knowing that they're helping right uh and then expanding on this i have this this funny picture or funny to me anyway of ketogenic dog food <laughs> and so what are they really buying here <laughs> they're buying a feeling more so than they are buying dog food right because i don't think there's any evidence that ketogenic like dogs need to be eating eating ketogenic food but people spend two three four times as much on their dog food because it gives them this feeling of they love their dogs and they're really taking care of their dogs right and it's just ironically it's the same reason why people tend to give to artists is like they love the art they love the music they love the people they love the community and they want to support that and so what we have to do as artists which is the next point is we have to be able to articulate what is our value to another person and i have this formula that i've uh, I didn't develop this, I've totally stolen this, but this is called a unique value proposition. And this is a formula that you can use to answer the question, what do you do? And what happens most of the time is people give very, very generic responses um, to this question. They say, what do you do? They say, I respond, I'm a musician, I'm a filmmaker, I play saxophone, I play the flute, I sing, uh, I paint, right? They, they, they only give you this little action verb, right? But it doesn't, embedded in that answer is nothing to do with why should I care or what, what value does that do for me, right? And so uh, I'd like as an exercise for you both to, and you can have multiple ones of these for your personal projects, for a stream stand, uh, or for, for whatever you do. And, I, and it, it's just this, very simple formula of subject, action verb, preposition, and object. The subject is who is doing this, my organization, myself, we as a community, who is doing the action. The action verb is what you're doing. Uh, and I would encourage you to be creative with your action verbs and not just say like, I do this, or I paint, or I, I play, or something, right? And then, then the next step is your how, like what do, you, what, what, what do you actually create to accomplish that thing, right? And so for my Brave Sound New York City organization that I've built, I've written as an example, we proliferate the spirit, values, and music of the New York City jazz scene through live streamed concerts, podcasts, and audience outreach. So for my organization, it's very clear in this one sentence what our goal is, our mission, we're proliferating values, music, spirit, and how we do it is through concerts, podcasts, and audience outreach. I disrupt traditional gender roles with narrative comic books. Uh, this is not me. This is just an example of, that I quickly thought of. I inspire young composers by mixing Lady Gaga and Bach, right? I evoke 1920s nostalgia with saxophone choir arrangements and vintage music videos. Um, do you guys see how embedded in these, set, in these unique UVP, uh, unique value propositions, uh, it's very clear <laughs> what you are doing, what you're actually creating, what type of art, and what the value is to other people. That's awesome. Could I challenge you guys to make something with your own projects. Uh, it doesn't have to be final, but if you could say something, or like just take 30 seconds and just come up with something that matches either your organization or your own projects.
was a lot harder than I thought. Yeah. It could go so many different ways. I'm having, <laughs> I was like, my brain, uh. No worries, no worries. It can be, uh, none, none of this is final. And in the next slide, I'll show that you don't even have, have to lead with this all the time. Yeah. It be in the back, back of your mind. But I like that you mentioned that you could have one for yourself. Because I think that is the hardest question to answer is like, what do you do? And it's like, oh, well, you know, I sing and I, you know, I am involved in lots of organizations, but it's like, what organizations? What do you do? And it's like such a hard question. It is. But this is the foundational question that you have to answer for anybody to pay you money for what you do. Right. Because we agreed in our assumption that money is exchanged for things, ideas, feelings of value, right? And so if we can't articulate what our value is, which is the perpetual struggle of the artist, it seems, like we don't, you know, then it's going to be very difficult for people to deduce the value. <laughs> and sometimes people, artists, they get really fortunate and the art just really speaks for itself, and then they find, like, let's use Ornette Coleman as an example, right? So Ornette his, is pretty famously underspoken. You know, he doesn't really talk about what his music means, even though his music is, like, very esoteric, evocative, all these things. Uh, but he got fortunate in that, he, you know, he was the first African-American artist, jazz musician, to get a MacArthur grant. Uh, he was well appreciated by Leonard Bernstein and a lot of people that were very established. They were writing and going to his concerts and praising his music and he, he had that institutional support just by the music itself. And I think that's what a lot of people are going for. They just want to create the art and then the art is itself the value, right? Um, but I think in 2021 with all the noise and competition like i feel like i feel like we have to be more targeted than that we have to really much articulate and think about what it is and this can change over time it can change a week from now it can change a month from now 2 years from now 10 years from now like you can always have shift your values and shift your goals um but yes any any thoughts yet <laughs> or should i move on I want to keep. I want to keep thinking about it. Let's come back to it maybe a little later, um, because I definitely fall into that that pitfall of just making art for the sake of it. Um, right. And like, I always, not it was never an assumption, but I always hopes that just by playing, like a at a certain level, a certain kind of music, um, writing at a certain level, that the audience would just come. But it doesn't work that way. And I. I realized that. Um, so I got to think about this statement a little more because to, to narrow in on the scope, I feel like I have a couple different ways to go and I'm not sure which one I like the best right now. So sure, I got to think sure. about it a little more. Nice. What's also a cool exercise for learning about this is to, you know, look at, look at your statements or look at your Spotify reports or whatever, like look at what artists you do spend money with or what artists you listen to the most or uh, consume the most of their their work, right? And then really analyze what does this do for me? So for example, Jacob Collier is somebody I check out a lot and his music, you know, definitely pumps me up. But most of all, Jacob Collier like inspires me to create like just with his excellence, his fluency on so many instruments, uh, and how he does it all himself. He's really a one-man band, and he's so encouraging. He teaches me to be a better person, to be a better musician, and all these things. And I, I feel like he, his presence makes my life better, right? His art makes my life better. And so, you know, when his record comes out, I'm going to buy it, you know? When he, his tour is coming, his Jesse 2022 tour, <laughs> which may, I guess, will be happening... Um, you know, I'll be there, right? And so this is the ultimate question. So the next thing you might be thinking, but this is UVP is kind of corny, like it's so it's so black and white. 
uh, and Jacob Collier doesn't have a UB, UVP. And then, so this comes to this next point of articulating your value. Um, if you're fortunate enough to have a unique value proposition that is just super cut and dry, this is what I do. Uh, I think it's, it's very helpful for artists that are working with some type of social aim, a very like clear uh, social justice objective. They can say, I make large scale art installations that reflect the black experience or, you know, uh, in, in that, that case, it's very helpful to just use your UVP. But n a lot of the times, what you want to do is brand yourself, right? So you want your name, just the mere mention of your name to evoke all the feelings and associations of your UVP, right? So, for examples, if I say the word nirvana, like this is not just a word, like there's all sorts of punky, hellish, 90s, like there's probably sounds, there's smells, there's visuals associated with that word, right? And all those things that that word brings about you is the value that they present to their consumers. Their consumers enjoy feeling like that. They enjoy feeling punkish. They enjoy unleashing. They enjoy that music. Stevie Wonder is a totally different world of art, right? Um, you feel good. You feel warm. You feel like dancing. You feel there, there's family like involved. Like, isn't she lovely, you know, for his baby daughter? You know, it's like, if just the name Stevie Wonder to me, it already feels like a hug. It feels like warmth. Uh, Postmodern jukebox for like a less mainstream example. Or if you guys are familiar with them, they take like pop songs and they make them like very twenties. Very uh, they 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 work with dancers and they 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 have a vibe, you know. And I'm not into them at all, but a lot of people are, and it's it's very clear why they w who would be who is this for? It's very clear. Uh, and then the last example I gave is Miles Davis. You know, Miles Davis never said, my music means this because of this, or like, this is what I'm trying to do with my music. He was, you know, famously very cryptic and very, uh, you know, shrouded in darkness, right? And people, but that's exactly why people love him, and that's the value that they get from consuming his music, from being in the know, like, with Miles... Miles is kind of synonymous with hip, right? <laughs> so all of this is kind of under this larger umbrella of personal branding, you know? If, and you, you can do this with people like this famous or even, um, like I'm from the jazz world, so I know like the, that type of people, but if you think of Snarky Puppy or Chris Potter or Ambrose or anybody that's you know gaining recognition Joel Ross for a younger example like all of those names those are personal brands and the people who love their music get value from it uh, I don't know if they went ahead and like this like cut and dry spelled out what my val the what the value of my music is maybe they did maybe they didn't but regardless their music clearly has value they're they're their artistic world um, encompasses a lot of feelings. Um, and what's beautiful about this is that, you know, art, different people derive value from the same piece of art in different ways. Um, and that, that's a beautiful thing too. But like I said, it's this, val this, this balance of you're a modern musician with a lot of competition. You're on this really crowded social media space, and like the clearer you can be about it, the cl the easier it will be for people to find you, understand what you're about, and follow you and support you. So you have to find the level of clarity that you're comfortable with in your in your work, right? And this next slide, I say you have a personal brand already. Stream stand as new as it is, it already has something. Ben Fortunato is like already a thing. Austin Zhang is already a thing. 
it might not be if you haven't like consciously crafted it and you just kind of put out whatever it might not be what you want it to to be but there is already the people who know you or know the digital you uh, rather there's already associations there right uh, but I do want to emphasize that your personal brand is not the same thing as you it is a creation uh, and a set of assumptions that people make about you uh, from the content uh, that you put out into the, the, the digital world, right? Uh, so I mentioned that because if you make the digital personal brand you synonymous with yourself, uh, that is a big recipe for kind of like mental health collapse and being like very vulnerable to haters or something, right? If somebody on, on one of my, well, here's an example that maybe is kind of revealing, but like, let's say, so on my social media and on my personal brand, I'm trying to educate people about uh, music business and I'm, I'm putting on this workshop and in a way, I'm kind of positioning myself as somebody who knows about those things and is going to teach about those things. Um, but that is not necessarily what I do on my day-to-day -day basis. It's not necessarily who I am all the time. Uh, that's just like one hat I wear and that I want to do on the internet, right? So if some, if some hater comes onto my profile and just says like a bunch of mean shit and like you don't know what you're talking about or whatever it's not i mean in all honesty it'd probably be like really annoying and frustrating but the personal brand me the, the digital me that i am making and crafting and putting out content to support and build is not the same thing as me what he's attacking really is some digital assumption or approximation of me it's not me so if i'm if i have that mindset then those type of insults can kind of can kind of uh bounce off more but i just say that because it's a very easy trap to fall into uh and i want to give a couple more examples of really really strong personal brands uh are either of you familiar with jocko willink Can't say I am. So he's like a retired Navy SEAL. Uh, and he's more famous than other retired Navy SEALs because he's really taken uh, advantage of the internet and formed a podcast and starred on Joe Rogan and talked about his experiences. And he his name is very much like... <laughs> I mean, just look at this Jocko podcast, leadership and discipline, right? So it's like he, what he's all about is discipline, militaristic, like ownership and like being hard, like very masculine type of ideals or something like that, right? Uh, and something he does on his Twitter uh, in this same, to build this image of like hustle, always working hard, um, thing I mean it's so funny he's he's <laughs> discipline equals freedom <laughs> it's 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 almost like it's almost com comical like how focused it is right um, every morning around 4 a.m. he posts a picture of his watch showing that he got up and he's already like broken a sweat by 4 a.m. every single morning without fail on his Twitter so where's 419? 419. 4 a.m. He just he just posts that every single day. <laughs> and so where's the 18th? Sometimes he tweets a lot. Well, maybe he didn't do the 18th. But here's or maybe I skipped it. But here's the 17th. And you see how he has this personal brand of hustle and military and all these things that he's very deliberately trying to associate with his name. And going back to that point earlier of you are not your personal brand, uh, I'm sure he's much more nuanced than this. <laughs> I'm sure jo Jocko Willink 
cries at some, sometimes. I, I mean, clearly he wakes up at four thirty every four every four a.m. every day. But um, I'm sure he sl- even he slips up sometimes, and you know, he he's trying to make a brand that inspires people, that brings out more than more out of people that than they thought they had. If that makes any sense. Uh, and he wants his his name to do that for people, even though he, as a human being, like we don't even know him, we've never met him. You guys have just now heard of him. All this personal brand is not him, so that's the point I want to make. Um, ah, this is a, a fun one. So, a lot of these ideas I'm learning now have been from this author Derek Sivers, and he is all about making. He's all about a lot of things, but I think he really encourages weirdness <laughs> and being, uh, like, sticking out from the crowd and being memorable. Uh, making He thinks marketing is basically making it easier for people to uh, remember you, right? And so he has this story called Captain T. Uh, it's from his book, Your Music and People, which is a great book on music business and authoring. I wonder how long his reading of it is. Let me see. Ah, it's three minutes. So I'd like to take three minutes of this workshop and just play this audio file because I think it's a great, great example. And he'll read it with more personality than I would. Uh, I think it's a a great example of personal branding, making yourself memorable, standing for something, having value that is very clear and yeah all these things i've been talking about well wait let me make sure i'm sending you my computer audio let me know stop me if you can't hear this hi i'm derek sivers and this is a chapter from my book called your music and people to get it go to sive.rs Maybe this will work. Hi, I'm Derek Sivers, and this is a chapter from my book called Your Music and People. To get it, go to sive.rf. Funny, but he stayed. Can you guys I wanted to be all? considered conspiracy theories. Yeah, we can. Area 51 oh, and can. aliens. Yeah. Hi, 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 I'm Derek Sivers, oh, and this is a chapter from my book okay. called Your oh, Music okay. and People. To get it, go to sive.rs. Captain T. Back in 1997, when The X Files was still on the air, a friend of mine who called himself Captain T recorded an album that was all about conspiracy theories, Area 51, and aliens. It was intentionally funny, but he stayed in character. He acted like a guy who was trying to tell the world about government cover ups. We wanted to send his album to college radio stations, but couldn't afford to hire a real radio promoter, so we decided to do it ourselves. We decided to make his marketing an extension of his art and image. I had visited many college radio stations and saw that the kids there would receive 20 packages a day, all exactly the same, in the same boring envelopes, with a little cover letter saying the same thing. Please consider this album for airplay. I wanted to be considerate and give them something different. So, we bought 500 black envelopes, 500 sheets of brown paper, 500 alien head stickers, and 500 huge red labels that said, Confidential, do not open for any reason. We did a mail merge to the 500 program directors at 500 college radio stations so that each one got a personalized printed letter that said this. Dear name, you don't know me, but I live in the bushes behind your station. I've been here for 12 years and your station has saved my life many times over. The music that you play has kept me going through my darkest of days, and for this, I owe you everything. 
so I must tell you that a man named Captain T found me in the gutter yesterday, and he taught me about what's really going on with the government cover-ups and what really happened down there in Area 51 with the aliens. This man has a message that you have to get out to the world because people need to know the truth. Signed, The Man in the Bushes, looking through your window right now. We took each letter out to the backyard and rubbed it in dirt, then crumpled it up. Then we put the crumpled letter and CD into each black envelope, sealed it with an alien head sticker, and finally covered it with a huge label that said, Confidential, do not open for any reason. And that's what we mailed to each radio station. Now imagine you're that college kid receiving 20 boring packages per day. Then you get this scary black package that says, do not open. When you open it, it's covered in dirt and says, you don't know me, but I live in the bushes behind your station. 375 of the 500 radio stations played it. Every now and then, my friend Captain T gets approached by someone who used to work at a college radio station back in 1997. They tell him they still remember it because it was the coolest package they ever got. That's so funny. That actually like ha- had something very similar to that happened on my campus. Uh, someone left uh, like thumb drives around campus and left like a little uh, like a chalk drawing of like this weird symbol. And my friends found it and they like tracked it down, took all the clues. And it literally led to like, I think it was an electronic playlist. I don't remember, but it was something, it was something so silly, but it looked so legit, like so real. People thought they were like cracking a code and yeah, yeah, it was wild. (laughs) Thanks for sharing. That's amazing. Yeah. I've, I've probably read that story a dozen times and it still makes me laugh and think about like, what could I be doing to make my marketing more creative? What can I be doing to make my brand and my name stronger and all these things? It's, it's a really good good story. Uh, ben, did you have any thoughts about that or? Yeah, that was, that was like the sheer ridiculousness of that it works. Like how, I, I'm trying to figure out a way, I mean, it does make me think a lot how I can use that kind of like shock factor in my own marketing. Yeah. Um, and it's totally a real thing. It's it's has its own like gravitational pull in itself to just do something outrageous like that. Yeah. Um, so that's I'll, really I'll, cool. I'll share with you one way that I've used this idea <laughs> of just being memorable uh, at Brave Sound. So Brave Sound, briefly mentioned, is this digital music venue that I run, and we do live stream concerts of New York City musicians. And so I want to brand Brave Sound. When I want you to think of Brave Sound, I don't want you to think of some generic place where people live stream stuff. I want it to have a personality, a vibe, a color scheme, you know, sounds in your ears, just like the Vanguard. Like if I say the Vanguard, you, you smell like that dingy basement. You remember being shoulder to shoulder with that stranger while Joe Lovano was like 10 feet in front of you. Like you, that all those experiences are infused in the Village Vanguard. And it's a lot harder to do that when I don't have a physical space and Brave Sound is just a digital creation. Um, but here is something I do. So when you order a live stream ticket from us, we have this thank you letter that says, Hello, fan. First, a big thank you. You are our favorite customer. We have many distinguished customers here at Brave Sound. Thor, Strongest Avenger, Chuck Norris, Peter Griffin, and even Flo from Progressive. But yes, you read that right. You are our favorite customer. We've been fighting, toiling, tossing, and turning about this decision for weeks. Thor had mesmerizing abs, but then he got fat. Flo saves us thousands of dollars on our car insurance, but honestly, we're a little freaked out that she never blinks. Chuck Norris knows Victoria's secret, but won't tell us, and Peter isn't even real. So there you are. You are our favorite customer. And as our favorite customer, you are entitled to a certain amount of respect or worship around here. Each morning, we mindfully approach your favorite customer, Busk, that glorifies our office. 
we kneel down on Persian rugs, light pumpkin spice candles, and cry a little bit as we reflect on just how favorite of a customer you are to us. Please accept this live stream as humble tribute to your favoriteness. Access the concert here. And then there's the link to the concert. <laughs> Stupid. That's but great. I, like <laughs> <laughs> I definitely would have clicked if I got something like that. Right, right. So Yeah. And it's also a thing that people don't I don't think many people read it actually. <laughs> so it, it's it's that thing that'll be kinda like a nod to like the super fans, which I'll I'll talk about I'll touch on lately about the importance of those people who you know, there's gonna be many people who get exposed to your to your art, but there's going to be a much, much smaller percentage of people that, like, love your art and will financially support your art. Um, I'm rambling a ton. It's been 43 minutes. I'm still in my introduction, but I'll, 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 be, I'll be quicker. So, and here's a, another example that I like to think about. Uh, think about if Nike had a hotel. Like, what would this hotel think like? What, what would it look like? And, you know, so if you take even 10 seconds to think about that, like, you you know there's absolutely going to be a big, massive gym at this hotel. There might be, like a, like, a glass case with the coolest Jordans and sneakers in there. There might be, there's going to be basketball courts in the hotel, you know. It's going to be all orange and black. Like, all the, the hotel staff are going to be wearing, like, athletic clothes. And then... On the contrast, think about if Hyatt had a shoe. Probably absolutely nothing is coming to mind because Hyatt doesn't have a strong brand. They're interchangeable with like Hampton or like Marriott or whatever. It's all the same thing. Is You're just going to pick whatever is cheaper, right? Or in the better location. There's nothing about uh, the Hyatt that's a brand, it's a commodity, right? And what did that to the hotel industry was like uh, like Priceline or those services where you just sort by price. It didn't matter because it doesn't matter which hotel it is. You know, you see the star rating, you see the location, you see the price and you say, okay. But like if, you, if Hyatt had a shoe, it's essentially nonsensical versus Nike is a brand because they do so much advertising and they work with athletes and personalities, you know. Hi hi it doesn't have any brand reps, you know. Versus you could be a one of a kind hotel if you were like, I don't know, like the beaches resort in uh some tropical Tibetan island or something. You could you could be weird about it and be a category of one. And then price would be irrelevant and now I'm rambling, but <laughs> this will all make sense later. And then this is to address that second assumption, Karen. Um, so before we look at the numbers, so my, my second assumption was that your art and music are deeply valuable to millions of people. And uh, yeah, I agree with this. So there's this essay that made me think about this. It's, I definitely recommend everybody reading it. It's called A Thousand True Fans by Kevin Kelly. And you see, it's already in my suggested because I read this like at least once in a month. And it contends that you only need a thousand true fans to make a, a hundred thousand dollar a year income. Because you, at, if you do the math, a thousand, he defines a thousand true fan or a true fan as somebody who's willing to spend something like a hundred dollars a year to support your art and your soul as a small creator who's not trying to be Kanye West as a small artist like your goal should be to find a thousand true fans and if you think it's only realistic for somebody to for you to earn fifty dollars a year per fan then you need two thousand or if you are like a high scale artist and you think uh, your paintings are going to sell for 10,000 each minimum, then you only need like 10 fans. <laughs> you know, it could go either way. Um, but you need to put kind of, I think it's helpful to put a number on what you're actually going for. And this 1,000 true fans really drove that home to me. 
Uh, and my own experience with Brave Sound really reflects that because Brave Sound has something like 300 Instagram followers and 300 people on our email list and stuff, yet we've made, we're not making 100 grand a year, but we've made several thousand dollars in the first four months of 2020, 2021. So I think this article makes it very clear that you can leverage a small audience if they are a paying one and you're if you're delivering something valuable to them uh that you can make income from very very small audiences you don't need to be verified on twitter or on instagram to have a paying crowd that being said you probably could reach that many people so uh there are 7.9 billion people in the world right that's the population and so if, you, if your art only appealed to one in a hundred people, you asked a hundred people on the street to listen to your music, only one of them liked it. You would say your art is pretty niche, right? Um, yeah, you would say it's pretty niche. But if you do the math, 7.9 people, I mean 7.9 billion divided by a hundred people, your art will still be valuable to 79 million people. If your art is super, super niche, only one in a thousand people in the world will like it. 7.9 million people. And if you're really like, just, you just make crazy shit, right? <laughs> and your art only appeals to one in a million people there are still 7,900 fans of your music waiting to find your music in the world. They do exist. So unless your art only appeals to one in 7.9 billion people, <laughs> you probably have a thousand true fans that you can find and produce an income from, right? And again, just continuing on this whole theme of personal branding I'm really I'm really big on niching down as small to the smallest viable audience because I feel like the if you find a niche that is underserved you'll have it's a greater likelihood that those people will value you because they're that need is underserved and they'll pay for you and they'll feel you'll have a much more intimate connection with a deeply loving audience of a thousand versus you know kind of generic whatever and you have a hundred thousand people and they, you're just kind of one of a crowd right if you can make yourself a category of one uh, an example of this that I like to think of is excuse me John Zorn you know his music is really really out there but he can fill any club he wants to you know he has a really really loving crowd and you know i'm pretty into esoteric music but sometimes <laughs> john zorn gets too much for me you know <laughs> but people love john zorn and i i would say he's probably like one in a thousand or one in ten thousand people you know probably like john zorn's music but it's probably still like there's there's still that people there um, and this, an ex this, is, this is an example that I really like as well because this person doesn't even have a website or any presence, web presence to speak of, really. So there's this, there's this forum that a lot of... I'm, I'm like an amateur audio engineer, so I spend a good amount of time on this Gearspace forum, right? Um, and the number one website for pro audio. So people talk about gear and they talk about audio and plugins or what have you. And in, in this world, there's like a big need for NOS tubes, which stands for new old stock tubes. So if you're using, people are really after uh, vintage tubes or new old stock tubes uh, to stick in their microphones so they can have that sound of like a Neumann or something from like the 50s they want like vintage tubes but vintage tubes are really tricky to buy because there's all sorts of Chinese knockoffs 
they might be like something like 50 or 60 years old so like they might be broken you don't know they're very finicky like you have to burn them in there's maintenance involved whatever right and so on this forum if you have any question related to buying vintage tubes the people on this forum will recommend this forum member Bowie <laughs> well I guess the link is broken right now but um and so I emailed Bowie because I was in the market for a tube and I'll show you this these email conversation I, I sent him this short email basically saying I needed a tube and he sent me every option I possibly had the price ranges what to look out for um, everything I could possibly I need I said great sent in the money and then he sent me this great email with what to look for when it arrives how to install it how to maintain it how to burn it in and all these different things and so this guy has a, a reputation a personal brand on this forum and he makes a business out of it and he makes income from it and he doesn't have a website he doesn't have social media or anything and it's so niche it's like people not even just the vintage tube market but the the, the pro audio vintage tube market because tubes in other contexts do very different things and so this is such a random example but I just wanted to share it to show you how random it can get and you can still find a market of people who are willing to pay you money to do something if you're a category of one nobody else provides this service if you google like information on tubes it's all very scarce and scattered and nobody really knows what they're talking about you know so that, that's why this guy is a category of one if you need a tube for your microphone there's kind of nowhere else you can get it um, and it, it's funny like he doesn't have a website he's not Google searchable it's like he found where the community is it's on this forum and that's it another example back to music and art speak is Esperanza Spalding uh, if you want I mean not only is her voice very irreplaceable and individual and evocative but also her bass playing as well and so you know if you want that sound on your record or if you want to hear a music that has that thing she's a category of one she's the only person that has Esperanza Spalding's sound and like nothing else will do um, and so if you love the feeling that you get from that music sure there's other artists uh, you could listen to but really she's a category of one and she's become a name and I think it's it's also interesting on some of Tom Harrell's um, Old and new. What, what's that Tom Harrell record? Something dreams. Something dreams. Colors of a dream. Colors of a dream. So in this, in this, in this band, they have two bass players, Ugana Okeguo and Esperanza Spalding. And it, it's funny to me because Tom Harrell uh, hired Esperanza Spalding, even though he already had a bass player, <laughs> but had her sing and play bass, and he had two bass players because he heard Esperanza's thing on his record and nobody else could do so uh, Karen does this convince you that there's probably at least a million people that would like your music oh for sure <laughs> great yeah, Austin, I had a quick question um, sure. about like the especially the Esperanza topic yeah. um, I think a lot of people go into music at least from what I've seen in my own experience that we we hope that our music itself will have its own brand. You know, do you know what I mean by that? Like, you know, when you think of Carla Blay or Thelonious Monk, like their their compositions have a brand in itself. Yeah. And I feel like people want that for their own music, but it it doesn't it doesn't always pan out that way. I still feel like there are many replaceable, like, to be honest, like modern jazz composers that you can kind of mix and match them and you kind of don't know <laughs> what the hell you're listening to. Right, right. Man, it's because people are afraid to focus. Yeah. You like think about um, like, uh, I don't know if you know this alto player, Will Anderson. He, he tours with Lincoln Center sometimes yeah. he, he's like a very like trad guy and people give him shit because he's they say he's like stuck in the in the 40s or something but he does that 
and he's a category of, of one. Like, if you want somebody to play that music and play it well, like, you call Will Anderson, right? And I think it, it it's funny. Like, it's all about building that brand. If you see on the smalls, like, a uh, calendar, like, the Jalil Shor- Shaw Quartet is playing, like, his music has a brand. Like, you have an idea of what that's going to be like uh, that whether or not you'd want to be there <laughs> Tom Harrell for sure but to your point like people are afraid to focus and there's another quote by Derek Sivers the guy who uh, authored that Captain T story we heard about uh, and one thing he likes to say a lot is don't be a donkey and what he means like by that because um, a common issue for people our age is that we have so many interests i love jazz i love pop music i love funk i love stevie wonder i love michael jackson i love like ornette i love like african music and stuff but there's no focus to that you know there's like how does how do i build a brand off of this and some people some people make it work and i'm always cool with those uh things but there has to be a vibe there has to be some conscious thing right and so don't be a donkey talks about this idea of like so you have a donkey and this donkey is presented on the right with a big bale of hay and on the left with a big pail of water and the donkey is thirsty and hungry and he goes like do I want to eat this hay or do I want to drink water or do I want to eat this hay or drink the water and then sure enough he dies of hunger and thirst you know not even thinking about the fact that he could have just eaten the hay and then gotten drank the water or vice versa right and so you're going to get to all these things you want to do in your life for example the the best example of this is miles davis you know who can imagine a more varied artist than miles davis right from the work in the 40s through the 80s right and just about every decade was uh a new period, right? So you had the two great quintets and then even like subcategories within that and then his bebop period, his electric miles and even subcategories within that. So he's a very varied artist, but there's focus like through lines, like things that made Miles Miles, like he played trumpet throughout the whole time, you know, at least. Uh and he was moody and dark, like he didn't ever start making like I don't know, like <laughs> very bright, happy dance music at any point in time that I think. Um, It always had a a Miles thing to it. But also, his variance was defined by periods of intense focus. Like the first great quintet, they were together for like nearly a decade, you know, in some form. You know, they had Cannonball and and then Philly Joe was replaced with Jimmy Cobb, right? So in... Aside from that, I know the first quintet is just that group of five, but he was work he was dealing with that sound for something like ten years, right? And then with Ron Carter, Wayne, Herbie, second grade ten quintet, like that was that was that period, right? And that's you followed him during that period for that, and then the bebop period earlier when he was studying with Diz and like you if you followed Miles, it was because he was doing that, and then the electric period, it was. Like, when, like, obviously, Ben, you're, what, like, 23 or 24 or something, like, you've never spent 10 years on a project, (laughs) I assume, (laughs) and neither have I, and so we can have our period of focus and then move on to the next thing. I'm not saying you have to be this personal brand for the rest of your life and just be in this one category forever, but you need to have a project uh, you need to focus and you, you need to deal with something deeply or else you, you're never going to get to that category of one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. It's very insightful, for sure. Cool. And then a very quick note on why... So the title of the workshop is Building Online Careers for Modern Musicians. So why online? I mean, it's just pretty ridiculous. 4.72 billion as of April 2021. I got that stat from this website. I don't know if it's reliable, but fair to say there's billions of people on the internet. 
right? And so before, when I was talking about this idea of your music is valuable to millions of people, this was not a train of thought that was possible even 25 years ago, right? Because you could, there was no way in hell you could reach, have this type of reach, right? Because your options, I, maybe by television, but even television was still localized. There was no YouTube to like stream Chinese television in, this, in the States or anything like that. And before that, there was print and telegrams and things. The internet has just changed the game. And so 4.72 billion people are on the internet, and that number is just growing by the second, by the hour, by the day. And so you can do the same math, just using the internet, um, your reach is just magnified, if you, if you can learn how to use it, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then there's this idea of serendipity and discovery. All these platforms that you're on, uh, they offer the chance for your art, for your products, to be seen by new eyes. And there's this great article by David Perel. Uh, this is the URL, perel.com slash essay slash serendipity that talks about this idea of serendipity. Um, and he defines serendipity as opportunities you never expected to happen. Uh, kind of like luck, in a way. That person that gave you and a thousand dollar donation, that person that got you that gig, that person that introduced you to Winton Marsalis, is stuff you, you can't plan for. But there's things that you can do to put yourself out there more, to be to maximize serendipity, as David Perel says. And there's this whole article of how you use the internet to have more serendipity in your life, right? Uh, I can't get into all of it, but essentially you have to write and be on the internet and publish content, maintain a website, be a connector, open doors for other people, don't be boring, just like that Captain T, be memorable. Like all these things, being on the internet, being consistent online, it's going to open you, you up to so many opportunities you never even thought was possible, right? Because you can't plan for it. And I, I can't tell you how many, just by being active just recently, uh, on YouTube and with the Brave Sound brand, like I've gotten just a month ago, I was on a phone call with Bobby Columbi, who was one of the co founders of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. <laughs> it was so out, oh, and he called me, he cold called me, like because he had seen something I had put out or whatever, and we, we just talked about music for like total serendipitous thing <laughs> like the weirdest thing and it's just because I've, I've been very consciously putting myself out there as of late um, it's the only reason I'm doing this workshop because Ben has been seeing the work I've been doing and I've been putting out myself out there so my name came to his head I guess when he was thinking about something um, to present so these platforms social media for all their pitfalls they give they do have some element of discovery, and you know, there's all sorts of things with algorithms, like TikTok is more discovery right now than Instagram or whatever. But the important thing is to be putting yourself out there, and the internet right now is just an incomparable way of doing that. So now we're gonna now that we have these assumptions nailed down, we have to provide value to people, and our value is is valuable to many, many millions of people. Let's talk about some ways we can apply this in our work. And so I alluded to this when I talked about the internet, but content is king, right? Um, right. <laughs> before, before, I'll jump around here. I, I, I wasn't sure which order. So just to show you the importance of uh, putting out content on a consistent basis, and what it can do for the size of your audience, right? Uh, there's this page that I really love that demonstrates this called the same photo of Jim Carrey every day. Uh, and it basically eliminates all the variables of content quality, of artistic value or whatever. And the only thing that this page does is literally post the same 
photo of Jim Carrey every day. <laughs> like every day, all they do is just post the same photo of Jim Carrey. The only thing they have going for them is that it's funny, I guess. And 217,000 people follow this page. <laughs> It's like, it's hilarious. I love it. <laughs> so you have to be consistent and you have to be focused and people have to know you for something and all these things I'm talking about. It's like, put yourself out there. And um, I'll briefly, this is a whole talk in its own time, but specifically for musicians, I think this is the statement that I've been living by for the past six months. It's being able to create great sounding music from your bedroom at low cost, both in terms of money and time, is a modern musician's superpower, right? So I have, like you see, even on this Zoom call, like I have nice audio coming from an interface and a microphone. I have a professional camera. I have some lighting. This took me, I started setting this up like five, ten minutes before the Zoom call because this I make content and I like, I, I want to have good sound <laughs> and I, and it, it, this is just out. Like if you, if you have a situation where you have to set up your camera every time you uh, want to make content and you want to like put up a light and like figure out how to connect your interface and how to s do the settings all over again, like it's not going to work. And that, that's, that has to do with low cost in terms of time, right? So the setup, it needs to be there. It needs to be out, ready to use at all times. Uh, in terms of money, like I've come up with many creative solutions of getting great quality recordings with little money. Even your phone, if placed in the right w way, in the right room, can get a good sounding recording. Or they have those like lavalier microphones that you can plug straight into your phone jack. or or, you know, an SM57 in a Focusrite uh, solo interface is going to cost you, like, something like 150 bucks in total or $200, you know? Um, not to undermine those type of costs, but if this can be something that improves the quality of your content and builds an audience for you and helps you reach them and helps them consume your things, I would say that's going to be worth the investment in the long run, you know? Um, like I said, I, if, if, if you have technical questions about, like, how, how can I record things at lower cost, or I love talking about this type of stuff, you know? But right now we're talking about less the technical part and more the business and the idea. Uh, but just another example I thought of, like, MIDI is amazing. Like, you can have a, a MIDI keyboard and just make all the sounds you could possibly make, you know, and they're all gonna be professionally sampled and professionally recorded, and all it takes is a USB cable. Guitars and bass players, they can go through DIs, and there's all sorts of free, great sounding amp emulations that sound amazing, and you don't even have to have the money for an amp and cab, like all these ideas that could work for your specific situation, whatever you're trying to create. Speaking of whatever you're trying to create, you have to find your medium. Like, so for me, talking on camera, uh, this has taken a lot of work for me to build any type of confidence doing that. Uh, and it, of course, it's always a work in progress. But for some people, it's just totally off the table. They would never be able to talk into a microphone unless they had 10 drinks in them or something. And that's totally fine. I think everybody can find their medium. Some people are really great with photography and they can really be so expressive through that. Um, some people are great with the re written word, and if you're great with the written word, I re recommend you post in forums and Facebook groups and in Reddit, Quora, Medium. Are you, I don't know if you guys read Medium. I love Medium. Uh, Twitter, like whatever you do, like written word is king. Excuse me, if you can talk but you don't like the lights in your face, you don't like your if you're self-conscious or whatever, you can have a podcast and just speak. Uh, yeah, there's this guy I follow on Instagram who does like investment help and um, 
accounts and things. And he's, you know, people think of Instagram influencers as like, you know, swimsuit models. Um, and he, a lot of his stuff is just written like this. And people, tons of people follow him. Um, and he makes an income and he has a paid newsletter. And when he talks, he doesn't face the camera. He just speaks because he's not like an Instagram supermodel. It's not about how he looks. It's about what he's saying. And he's found a way to produce content that is he's comfortable with, you know? And I get a lot of value by following him. And it's, it's brilliant. Uh, and then once you're at a point where you have some income or if you just have some savings, you can start building a team to format convert. So it's very easy if you have if you're if you're a podcaster, let's say, it's very easy for you to use a service like rev.com, which I use all the time, that you just you just plug in your MP3 file or your video and then with astonishing accuracy for like a buck a minute or something, like they'll they'll just transcribe your video and you'll have you, you can have an assistant or you can do it yourself and you can add some formatting, some bullet points, some underlining, and you'll have a blog post from your podcast, right? If you're um, in, into the written word, like a lot of people are making like, like those robo explainer videos if you want to make. And so you can, you can take the text and have some robot or hire a voiceover artist to say your writing. <laughs> And you could use an animator to make cool uh, visuals, or you could use a photographer to make visuals that correspond with your writing. Or even use, it can even be more basic than that. Like you can even use PowerPoint and uh, get visuals going. But you can, you can format, convert audio to video with s some help from a team of people who are comfortable with those things. You can do writing to audio, you can do audio to writing, and every, every variation that so far. There, therefore, and I think the person to follow um, for that is this guy G Gary V, very famous guy. I'm sure, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, but he's definitely taught me a lot of things about this. And so he'll take interviews, and he'll he'll make them. And he's on everywhere: Twitter, Medium, Instagram, YouTube, and he has a team that does it all for him. Like they take his podcasts and they make them blogs. They take his zoom interviews and they make them like podcasts. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and I don't really follow him that much for his personality or his thing, but just to get ideas of how I can create content out of existing content. So I'm not just like making stuff all the time. You know, I can take, um, this long form podcast and make just little clips out of it. And so this is, this is just tips to help you do make more content at lower cost, higher quality content in less time, and not be so creatively drained. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you a couple of examples of people that I really like who do this. Um, Walter Smith, <laughs> W. Smith 3. He has this amazing new series where he's... Uh, taking standards and doing like saxophone choirs along and so he he's not on video at all and he's found a cool way to make his music visually stimulating and i would say that's probably half the reason people are so into them because the visuals are so fun and entertaining uh and musically it's also amazing because you know he's an inspiring inspiring player with a great sound and he has a deep knowledge of repertoire uh, so I get a lot of value from consuming his content and his and his work, and I think he does that very well. Lage Lund is doing something very similar. Um, Julia plays groove. <laughs> I love this girl on YouTube. And this is just to give you a peek into my world. Like when I'm consuming content, I look for these things. Like I look for what. Are people doing that is working what are people who aren't good speakers doing that allows them to c still communicate like this person I have no idea what her voice sounds like 
or anything. All she does is bass covers of pop songs. And she has half a million followers on YouTube. And they all follow, the, like she just found something. I guess I can play a little bit of it. Can't take the silence. this girl she sounds great always makes me want to play bass and this is literally all she's done for five years and she doesn't I don't even think she makes revenue from these videos because they're all copyright striked you know but from her audience now she has a patreon with nearly a thousand patrons that I'm sure pay her something like five dollars a month or something and that's you know that's that's an income that's revenue and so I love like so at some point in time, she said, like, I don't like speaking or I don't like writing. All I do, want to do is play bass, and this is all she does. And I think that's very inspiring, something within their comfort zone, right? And, uh, yeah, there's more examples. Uh, Jacob Collier is somebody who does it all. He does the video, he does the music, he does the Instagram lives, he's, he talks, he does the classes, everything. So more people to check out if you would like. And then... Yeah, really the last little bit here is about how do I monetize all this? I'm putting all this content out and I'm building an audience. Like how does this turn into cash for me? Uh, and the first option for that is donations. You have to, at the very least, have people who love your content. If I'm following you and I love your content, there's some likelihood if you make it visible <laughs> that a place you know a paypal me link in your link tree or in your instagram bio or whatever like some place where it's it's visible uh mentioned in your content that people can support what you do if they like it you should at least have a payment gateway of some sort where somebody can give you money and i like ways that offer a custom amount and offer a recurring donation. So I'll show you the one on my website. Under the support. So this, this form, it has, it has like those tiers, right? But it also has a custom amount. So if, if somebody were to donate a thousand, ten thousand dollars, they at least have the option too. And I've gotten I have gotten $600 donations or whatever. It's like crazy like how generous people might be if you give them the option, right? So that's the thing I don't like Patreon because they have all these tiers, but like if somebody wants to really help you out because you know, their financial circumstances are very different than your own, then it's not a big deal for them to give you a grand or whatever. Like there's not even an option to, right? And there should always be an option for a monthly subscription if if they'd like um and patreon is the most uh recognizable way people do that obviously um but so it says here would you rather take a 500 hundred dollar one-time donation or 20 dollars a month and you'll always want to take the recurring one because the recurring revenue is is just really helpful when you're talking about <laughs> sustaining yourself for a long period of time right so at the very least if you're building an audience, say you have those thousand true fans, you never know that serendipity will happen. You want to at least have a place where people can send money if they want. Uh, you can also look into things like grants and fiscal sponsorships, like I see you guys have done through Fractured Atlas with uh, StreamStan. Um, these two creators, Dan Weiss and Ari Honig, they use Patreon really, really well. So I'll show you guys the Patreon for... Dan Weiss, he's probably got like a few hundred or something uh, patrons, yeah, 300 patrons, and he's built an audience by putting out content on Instagram and by being a badass drummer who performs at clubs, and so he's built a name and an expertise, and now he has a way for people to support him, and they get lots of value from it. It's literally the same formula 
over and over again. What are you offering me in terms of value? Okay, I'm going to pay you money for that, right? And he has a very tangible and educational way of offering value to his audience. So that's method number one. Method number two <laughs> is digital goods. Uh, and I've listed a ton of uh, examples of things you could create uh, in leveraging that audience of people who know, like, and trust you. Uh, and the thing about digital goods is that they're infinitely scalable. If you have a PDF or an ebook or something, or an album even, it's like one person could buy it, a thousand people could buy it, ten thousand people could buy it, whatever. It's all the same, you know. It doesn't cost you a penny more. It's also untethered to time, which is a big issue for musicians because I think I read that jazz musicians derive 70% of their income from live performance where they have to be there. It's reliance on their physical health, their mental well-being at the time for them to come and perform the gig, their availability. Uh, yeah, so what happens if you're sick? Um, or what happens if some tragedy happens and, I don't know, you broke your arm or something and you can't play saxophone, right? That's lost income versus a digital good. You put in the effort once. You create the product. Um, you can sell it as many times as you want. And now that you have an audience, you've built it up through content creation. They like what you do. They understand the value that they get from following you. They're, more, they're much more likely to buy from you, right? Uh, so that's why I would typically kind of wait to do digital goods until you've built up some type of even a small audience of paying fans or, or of fans who really like what you do because that's always what's going to do so you see that's why you see youtubers or like content creators that like they build up an audience and then once they're at like some following then they like release their new course or their new ebook or whatever it's because like if, you, if all you do is release your course or your ebook and you haven't built that trust with an audience, you haven't uh, connected with people enough, they're not likely to buy it from a stranger unless you just have a great ad, uh, which could work as well. Um, but I wanted to give an example of a digital good, <laughs> in a sense, uh, that was very creative and as you may have realized I love creative solutions for this, is Wolfpack. Um, they sold the, the track 10 on their album, so they were releasing a new album, and they on eBay, they just auctioned the 10th track. I guess it's off and away. <laughs> uh, and so whoever won the eBay au auction could put whatever the, the hell they wanted as track 10 on the next Vol Wolfpack album. Uh, and I think it, it fits the band's aesthetic very well because they like are very uh, close with their fans and a lot of their fans are themselves musicians. It's kind of that type of band and it's sold for over 70K. <laughs> and they can do this again and again. <laughs> it doesn't cost them anything really, as far as I can tell, to put this song on their album. Uh, NFTs, I don't know anything about, much about NFTs, not enough to really talk about them, but I would definitely say they're worth looking into. Um, there's a lot of hype right now around them, and I think they're, they're going to be here to stay for a while. That's a whole other topic, but again, digital goods, ebooks, PDFs, courses. Um, another way of doing courses that I wanted to share, so when you think of creating a course, it seems like a very daunting task where... Um, you have to make a curriculum and like a a 12 week thing but there's this guy i follow and as pretty much all the examples i've given you are people i've followed for a long time or paid money to um myself and so he he makes courses about entrepreneurship and finances and stock market investing and so he sells these courses, um, and what all they are when you buy them, so you buy them through his Gumroad, and see in this, he teaches you how to trade in the stock market, how to create a watch list, all these things. So I bought this course, and all it is is him on a Zoom call with nobody, <laughs> 
at, for an hour explaining how he trades on the stock market. There's no, there's no editing. There's no lighting. There's no fancy camera. There's no microphone. It's him talking to a webcam. But the information is so good, and he's made so many people money that he sells a ton of these courses, <laughs> you know? Uh, so whatever is in your means, whatever is within your skill set, within your comfort zone, there is a way you can create a digital course or, or a digital good of some sort. And I think, yeah, so photographers, you can do Photoshop or Lightroom presets, all these ideas, right? Then, um, I love this too, physical goods, um, higher cost for scale, can be untethered to time, meaning if you have somebody else that you've hired to fulfill the orders and ship them out, then in that way they'll be untethered to time, but if obviously, if every order that comes in you have to personally fulfill and get it to the post office, then that is a high time cost. And I like fill physical goods because they're more easily filled with personality and again so there's this um, pianist by the name of Dan Teffer and he's a jazz pianist but he's also very into technology and he codes and he has this project the natural machines project where he visualizes music using various computer algorithms and so the physical product that Dan sells on his website um, purchase these s these sandstone sculptures and of harmony visualized so this is using his algorithms this is what a major triad looks like this is what a minor triad looks like and th these are beautiful and he can sell them for a decently high ticket because they're one of a kind they're a category of one you're not going to find this anywhere else and it's super it's 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 super on brand for him and yeah, Austin, I actually have one. <laughs> I have a couple of them. You have the yeah. So yeah, this is the, this is the minor so cool. one. Yeah, they're they're so fascinating. Right. So yeah, I'm obsessed with them. <laughs> I'm I'm really I'll glad. That... Again. Very nice. I got yeah, I minor and major. One. They're cool. Yeah. They're really cool. Super cool. Wow. Well, beautiful example of an artist you paid money to because he offered you something of value. He offered you a visualization um, that you look at and it brings you some sense of joy or fascination or what have you. Um, this is the I Hate Elvis Buttons is a pretty famous example where um, Elvis Presley's manager and press team. So Elvis, I guess, was like a very controversial artists like a lot of people were super in love with him and a lot of people really hated him so his management decided to sell I hate Elvis buttons and they made a ton of money off the haters as well <laughs> as well of, of course they had their pro Elvis um, merch as well but also what I like about Dan's stuff is that you could be like very as an artist you could be very uncreative about merch like you can make a t-shirt or a mug and, you know, it's just kind of added clutter in people's homes. But Dan Teffer found a way to sell a physical good that was very beautiful and value-adding and, again, on brand. Um, another example I like to talk about is Fabian Almazan has built this um, record label called Biofolio or Biophilia Records, and they sell biofolios. <laughs> and so this is an environmentally conscious record company. Um, and so they... They don't. They refuse to sell CDs um, because they're like very. You can't really recycle the pl plastic generated by them. So they wanted a way of giving people a physical product in as environmentally friendly of a way as possible, and they came up with this biofolio, and they're just they're just gorgeous, and they sell music uh, in these like. Mm. And you need to see like the big fold out. Where where can you see the big fold out? <laughs> Maybe on Bandcamp they have photos. Huh. Or Instagram. <laughs> Perhaps. Mm. What? Or maybe just Google images. Let's see if they have photos. Wow. 
that is absolutely not it. <laughs> Biofolio. I wish I had one. I have bought one, but they're all in storage for moving. Hmm. Me. Damn. In this in this store, they don't have photos of them. Wow. I think they used to. I just. I'm sure they're somewhere. I don't. I don't know where they are. But so it looks like a CD cover, but it actually folds up into some shape similar to this. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Uh, like this big like origami thing, and it's beautiful. There's like eight panels of artwork, and uh, li like lots of liner notes and things. Wow. So there's really just no photos of this anywhere. <laughs> Anyway, so they found a really creative way to give a, f a physical product that makes environmentally friendly audiences feel good about their purchase because the paper is, uh, you know, biodegradable and there's no plastic involved and all these things. Back to here. Ah, there, there's a trombonist by the name of Peter Lin who has this a album, New Age, Old Ways. And I guess he's like very into manga uh, and comic books. And if you buy the physical album, you get a comic book with a story written by him and illustrated by Kelly Lynn. Uh, and I think that's a very creative way um, because in his brand, he's like into the manga and, and comic book type of thing. And he includes a comic book with everything. I think Wayne did that as well recently. With his new record, he has like a <laughs> yeah. Let's win shorter comic. Yeah, in Eminon, there's a there's a graphic. It's pretty cool, and y you see these are kind of extensions of their art, of their music, uh, and they they sell pr physical goods very much. Um, infused with their personality and that provide value to people who like them. And then the last way of monetizing, uh, which if you're really at this step, you're probably not watching this at this point, but you can monetize the audience itself uh, rather than selling the audience. I mean, selling to the audience, you sell the audience essentially. Uh, and you can have your own ethical um, conversation with how ethical you think this is, uh, but you can partner with companies, shout them out in your podcast, in your videos, in your writing, in your music, in your social, in your email newsletter, whatever it is, and uh, you can get paid for that. You can use AdSense, affiliate marketing, where if you play a certain Nord keyboard or whatever, uh, you can have Nord give you a promo code and you, you guys all see influencers doing these things. I don't need to explain this, uh, probably. But the things with this type of income is I, I call them games of scale. Uh, less so with brand deals. Well, in a way. So these, these really don't kick in until you have really, really um, a large scale. And as I mentioned before, I'm all about monetizing the small audience, the thousand true fans, and giving them value and a reason to support you at a smaller size. Um, so, you know, I don't really deal with Spotify like a hundredth of a penny royalties or trying to hassle my PRO for my black box stuff or whatever. There are definitely a lot of experts on that who can really talk about how to maximize your streaming income or things like that. But for me, like, I'd rather have one fan sell them something for $25 than try to hustle for 50,000 Spotify plays to get 30. <laughs> so I, I don't even waste my time on those, honestly. Um, and there, there are experts for that as well. Um, and that's, that's, that's my presentation. Do you have questions <laughs> uh, over all of that <laughs> or anything that came to mind recently? 
maybe all that. was a ton of awesome stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, the ebooks thing actually um, it strikes my interest a lot just because now that I think really? about it, I have especially through quarantine, I've bought so many books from um, from jazz saxophonists in particular. Um, your old teacher Adam Larson, yeah, and especially um, when he came out with I mean any one of his series, I I like I love them all, um, and they're all super super challenging and and just fun and i it, i almost treat it as like a challenge like when he comes out with a new one i like have to like know what's in it just because the stuff he comes up with i'm like oh i wouldn't have thought of that so i just yeah. i'm like obsessed with them i'm like i gotta i gotta check out what he's on too so the books are a great idea just because like you can just you can make a series out of it and once you get one person to hook it they'll, they'll kind of just keep buying yeah. it's like the the give, like keeps giving exactly yeah exactly the only thing um, is that I think that people need to really reassess is when they send the books to other people for like to avoid paying. I think that's oh. super, I'm unfortunately like rampant within doing um, digital goods, giving yeah. a goods digital goods goods like that. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the the heart, probably one of the biggest things that you're gonna run into doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, which brings it probably into a whole other like legal world which that i'm very interested in as well but yeah super super incredible stuff well what are i mean he's selling the information in the books for sure but another component of what he's selling is again that feeling of supporting him and like being a fan of him and like what is he going to come up with next like just like you described, it was, it was perfect. Like, that's why you articulated, yes, you enjoyed the information, but it's like, you just, you enjoy him, right? And that's why you choose to pay for the books. And the people who just want the information, they don't really care about whether Adam gets any of the money or not. Like, that's not really the audience. I mean, you know what I mean? So as an example, with my business, Brave Sound, we sell tickets to live streams, right? And people can can absolutely, and I'm sure I I know it happens. Like people just pass around the links and stuff, right? But what's interesting is I did the math recently, and fifty percent of our revenue in 2021 so far has come from people like 25 people who donated a hundred dollars or more, right? So the cheapskates who are like like passing around the links or the people who don't have money and they can only afford a few dollars i definitely appreciate a purchase of any size but really all that matters to the bottom line at the end is those true fans who are willing to really put something in right so uh yes it's unfortunate that people choose to do that but at the end of the day i think the closer of a relationship you have with your audience, the more value you provide them and all these things I've been talking about, the more likely they're gonna want to support you in the financial thing. Uh, they'll do what they can, you know? Are there any comments in the, the YouTube thing or? So we got two um, oh, right. and one of them was, we can hear it and yeah, Austin. So nothing, no questions, yeah. but we got some support. So that's great. pretty great. Uh, a couple likes as well. Um, yeah. Karen, do you have any like comments or questions? Um, I don't know. I just think that this was a very, very, I think, I think like a lot of this I've heard before, but it was just nice, like hearing it from a peer, I guess, like somebody sure. who's actually like applying it. Cause you know, we learn these things in school and they talk about it, but we're like, you know, doing assignments and not really focused on like what we want to be doing at the time. So it's yeah. nice to hear, especially as we're about to graduate, because in like 16, 15 days, we're going to have all this free time, like back, you know? And yeah. so, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I just, there's lots of things that you said that resonated with me and that I just want to, you know, like sit with it and think about it because, um, yeah, like I just want, you know, especially 
now with um, vaccines rolling out and people getting back out into the streets and, you know, places opening back up, like, I feel like now is the best time to, like, evaluate these kinds of things, you know? Mm-hmm. So. For sure. But, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, I have to be honest, my whole perspective, like, has changed a lot as far as going for the niche markets. I did, you know, you know, even when people say you don't really believe it all the time. But I think through a lot of the examples you picked and just breaking it down, it's that was so clear. It was, Mm -hmm. it was like, why wouldn't you do it that way? Why do the Spotify thing as a jazz musician, it doesn't even make up a fraction of percent of right Any, like of of the total streams of uh of spotify like why would you even yeah. go that route like it's i think i even read thing. something that was like you can probably make more money from streaming on twitch than you know putting For your sure. music on spotify For sure. so i yeah i definitely encourage twitch they 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 charge pretty high fees but it the audience and creator relationships that are forming on twitch is pretty amazing <laughs> Mm-hmm. Amazing. I love to see that for sure. Well, th- I mean, thank you guys so much for hosting. I mean, I know it's uh, you guys have put a lot of work into fundraising and and scouting for different artists, so I'm very happy to be included. I have like s- a couple just conclusionary s- slides I can that just talk a little Please, bit yeah. m- more about what I do. So, mm-hmm. so Brave Sound, we are a digital venue for the best of New York City's creative and improvised music scenes. And essentially, we all these things I just talked about of finding the audiences, uh, engaging with them on social media, we tried to do this for musicians and all the things with production quality. So we just take, this is our website, bravesound.org. We take, um, we take artists and we give them a platform you know, a professionally recorded concert with great video and audio. We interview artists and give them a chance to speak. We publicize and we do all sorts of social media stuff to help get their their music out. And we have a podcast. You can see all our concerts here. Uh, And if you enjoyed the, the workshop today, definitely would appreciate you guys checking that out. And then finally... Yes, consider a donation to StreamStand and Brave Sound. If you have any questions, I can be found at these these locations. Um, yeah, and that, that that's that's for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody.